I think now I want to introduce Scott. Uh, Dr. Scott Claussen, uh, thank you for joining us today and agreeing to do this talk. Scott is a uh, researcher up at the Advanced Light Source, the ALS, um, doing great work up there with his beam line. Um, we had the pleasure of the consulting team to work with Scott uh, on what he's about to present here. So um, I think it's just a really cool topic. And I've actually talked about this a number of times. So I'm glad you all get to see what Scott's going to talk about. So I'm going to turn it over. Scott, welcome. And thank you for doing this. All right. There we go. Is that better? That's better. We got you. All right. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, everybody, for having me. My name is Scott Klassen. I am a beamline scientist at the Advanced Light Source. Um, most of you probably already know uh, what the Advanced Light Source is. It's one of the most prominent buildings on the hill. And here's a nice picture of it taken from the Lawrence Hall of Science. So Jeff asked me here today to tell you about some research. I wouldn't call it research necessarily, but some efforts that um, uh, we undertook uh, about a year and a half or so ago during lockdown. And I had an opportunity to really dive into some computational projects that I'd been wanting to um, get going. And I'll tell you a little bit about how we used Google Cloud Platform's AutoML platform to do some um, image recognition tasks at the Beamline. <clears throat> um, before I sort of give you the details about how we used Google Cloud Platform, I want to give you sort of a, some background information that will put in context the problem that we are trying to solve. So this is a floor plan of the advanced light source. It has, I think, almost 50 beam lines that do different types of research. There's all kinds of materials research that's done up here, basic science. Um, people are working on superconducting materials, uh, different types of stuff for battery research, stuff like that. Um, but the area of research that I am involved in is macromolecular structure and function. And so one of the main techniques that we use um, to do macromolecular structure is crystallography. And you can see crystallography is done at a, a number of different beam lines here at the advanced light source. And I was drawing little box or boxes around them. So the beam lines that I work at are uh, 1231, which does a crystallography and small angle X-ray scattering, and beam line 831, um, which um, was a beam line that was actually originated at UC Berkeley um, in the Department of Molecular Biology. It was Tom Alber was a, was a professor at UC Berkeley who sort of thought that it would be a good idea to have a world-class research beamline up the hill where graduate students, postdocs, undergraduates could go and get access to world-class research. So uh, the research I'll tell you about today um, is primarily centered around 831. Uh, and before I get into my talk, I throw up my acknowledgments here. Um, a large part of the funding comes from the National Institutes of Health through this project called ALS Enable. It's headed up by Paul Adams. Um, we also get a significant amount of funding directly from the Department of Energy to develop these um, analysis technologies. And I have to give a real um, enthusiastic shout out to Berkeley Lab IT, the scientific computing group, Sha Feng and Feng Shen. Um, really, without them, I would not have been able to get going on this particular project. We also have some support from a DNA repair grant through the National Cancer Institute. And I got help from a real programmer, Giles Mullen with Tetrahedron Technologies for some of the, the actual background um, integration of the Google Cloud vision stuff into our control system. And I'll tell you about that in the talk. So what is macromolecular crystallography? So um, many of you may sort of peripherally be aware of this technique. If you've seen any of the pictures in the last two years of, um, of the coronavirus, you know, with its red spikes on Time Magazine, if, I don't know, is Time Magazine still a thing? Anyways, you've seen these atomic resolution structures of viruses floating around in the popular media. And the technique that's used to determine what these things look like is macromolecular crystallography. There are, are other techniques like electron microscopy and NMR, which also can provide you similar types of resolution. It's essentially the ability to see molecules with, a, in theory, atomic resolution 
And so this technique is sure it's highly automated at this point. It's been around, you know, the first structures were solved in, in the 1950s with, uh, with um, hemoglobin. And essentially it, it's a pipeline that involves a researcher or a group of researchers producing some protein of interest, um, growing crystals of this protein. So that's essentially just getting your protein to line up into nice little rows in a three-dimensional space. We then use the X-rays, and in, in my case, from the advanced light source to shoot X-rays at these crystals. And when X-rays of a defined wavelength hit a crystal, they create a diffraction pattern. And that's what you're seeing here in the middle. And doing some reverse, some inverse Fourier transforms, we're able to turn this diffraction pattern into a real, real space. So this is a, and this is pretty much what I spent my PhD thesis studying. It was like how to go from these crystals to this structure solution. And once you have an electron density map, it tells you where, where all of the atoms are. You can see the carbons, the nitrogens, oxygens, then you build a model and to see how all of these different atoms are connected. Once you have this model, you can now start to develop and test hypotheses. Okay, this is the spike protein from coronavirus. How does it interact with the host cells? How could we interrupt or disrupt this interaction and prevent a viral infection? So, you know, you, you start to develop these hypotheses about how to do what you want to do. And these models are, are key for doing this. And so this whole pipeline is extremely automated. Um, the first thing, like when researchers are bringing their samples to the advanced light source to collect them, they need to grow these crystals. And so there's a company called Hampton Research, which pro provides all sort of like crystallization hardware and accessories and, and helps researchers sort of grow these crystals. And here is a sample of like some of the crystals and what they look like. They're generally like quite small, less than half of a millimeter. Like a half a millimeter big crystal would be a very large one. They can be anywhere from five, 10, 20 microns in size. So one of the key technical challenges for this technique of crystallography is to position this extremely small crystal into a very small X-ray beam. And the crystals are made of proteins. And so they're biological proteins. So they're actually quite delicate. Unlike a salt crystal or a sugar crystal where it can just sit on the shelf for years and years and years, protein crystals are sort of like milk or cheese, right? You'll leave, they will go bad after a while. So the way that researchers keep them safe is by, um, okay, well, before I, I wanted to just point out this as an aside, if you're interested in seeing some more pictures of crystals, head over to hamptonresearch.com because um, these crystals, they're actually quite beautiful. And if you view them through polarized light, they, they can be, um, you know, they're, they're quite beautiful to look at. So when, when researchers are preparing their samples to bring to the beam line, they will, they need to fish their, crystals out of the drops where they're grown. So they grow them in these very small little drops, you know, literally just the size of like 10, 20 microliters, something like that. And so using a microscope and, and a small loop, uh, the researchers will, will fish these crystals out of the growth solution. Um, and they'll use a number of different types of mounts. And the, the two main companies that sell these mounts are Mitigen and Hampton. And so traditionally, these, these ones on the right-hand side you see, these are nylon loops. They're made from a surgical thread that's about 10, five or 10 microns in diameter. And these surgical threads are then twisted to make a small loop like a tennis racket. And with those, you can kind of go into your solution and loop out an individual crystal. Um, Mitogen is a company that came along a little bit later and they use a lithography technique to make these various mounts, all different shapes and sizes depending on the size of the crystal that you have, you'll pick a different one of these to fish your crystal out. Um, and these, these loops, this Mitogen grids or these Hampton nylon loops are actually positioned on the end of a magnetic base. So we have these magnetic bases which allow us to position the samples at the beam line so we can put them in the X-ray beam. And you can see right at the tips of these needles, are glued the loops. And some of these you can see they have these little orange mitogen loops. Others have these little nylon loops. And so these magnetic support paces come in a bunch of different standards because of course everybody has to have a standard. Um, but they are, the one thing that sort of unifies them is that they have a magnet on the bottom and at the end they have a pen with a loop on it that holds your sample. 
So once researchers have looped up their crystals into one of these loops, they'll dunk it into some liquid nitrogen and store it in these various cassettes. So there's a bunch, again, there's a bunch of different standards um, that have been developed. One set of standards was developed uh, at the advanced light source. It's called an ALS puck. The one in the middle here was designed by a commercial entity. This one in the lower left was designed down at Stanford at the synchrotron radiation laboratory there. So you, researchers will, will then fill these pucks up with their samples, uh, stick them in a doer, and which will keep them at liquid nitrogen temperatures. And then they will be FedExed to the synchrotron. And that's when uh, we will receive them as a beamline scientist and our support staff will receive these doers and we will unpack their cassettes and put them at the experimental end station. So this is a picture of the inside of the experimental hutch at Beamline 831 at the Advanced Light Source. And it's a little bit crowded here, but I just wanna point out a few um, key elements here, some landmarks to give you a sense of how the experiment proceeds. So we have in the lower right here, we have a liquid nitrogen sample storage. So our samples are stored in here under liquid nitrogen. We have a, a robot. In our case, we are using a commercially available Epson pick and place robot that we've modified. And it has a, at the end of its, its actuator arm here, it has a little gripper, which allows us to grip the samples. And the samples, the robot then picks the samples up and moves them over to the sample goniometer. And at the very tip of the sample goniometer, you can see a magnetic, a magnet there. And that holds the magnetic pins that I showed you in the previous slide. And so the key here is to keep your samples at 100 degrees Kelvin the entire time, from the time they leave the, the, the lab, the researcher's lab, all the way until the time we collect the data, the crystals must be kept at 100 degrees Kelvin. And so there's, there's a stream here that, that kind of blows 100 degree Kelvin nitrogen over the sample the entire time. And the sample goniometer allows us to rotate the sample around an axis. So this is important during data collection as we're shooting the crystals with our x-rays, we need to be able to rotate the sample so we can collect data at a bunch of different orientations. And we also have a fluorescence detector in here, which allows us to do um, an analysis of the, the, the chemical makeup of the sample. Okay, so once the crystal has been, the robot has picked the crystal up <clears throat> and put it onto the goniometer, we can then visualize the crystal using uh, our magnification system. And so, this part has actually been automated for a number of years. And, and essentially, you know, when, when, a when a user sends us their samples, they might send us a hundred samples and they might be awarded eight hours of beam time in order to collect data on all 100, 150 of their samples. And so we have an automated pro process that will mount their samples, that will then de-ice the samples by squirting it with a little bit of uh, liquid nitrogen, because sometimes there'll be some little crystals of water ice that form on there. We then will center the loop. So the loop is defined, I'm um, defining the loop as what's inside this red box. We'll then use the x-rays to sort of slowly scan across the loop, looking for the parts that give us the best data. So that's step four, x-ray raster centering. And then once we've found the best, the part of the crystal that diffracts the best, then we'll center that part in the x-ray beam. And that would be like the sweet spot here. Um, in, 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 yeah, they're in green. So the crystal is in this yellow polygon here. And then the sweet spot where we want to collect the data might be a smaller region within the crystal. And then once we have that aligned with the X-ray beam, which is on the order of two to hundred microns, then we will collect the data set. And that involves rotating the crystal while we shoot X-rays at it. And then we dismount the sample and do this all over again. <clears throat> so until recently, the way that we did this step three, um, which was to center this loop, is we use sort of a classic machine vision technique where we would rotate the loop. So if you can see here, we're looking, it looks like a tennis racket. Now I'm gonna call that like the face on orientation. But as you rotate it, it becomes sort of thin in one dimension. And then as you rotate it back again, you see the face on. So we have edge on and face on. And so what we would do is rotate our sample 180 degrees and take a snapshot, just a JPEG image every two degrees. We convert the images to grayscale, <clears throat> do edge finding on each image, 
and then parameterize the image. So we'd be looking for like where, where is the rightmost pixel that is not background? And then we would define where the tip Y position was and where the pin base was and the width. And then we would define a box with minimum and maximum X and Y values that would define like where we determined um, sort of this loop would be, okay? And then we would return those parameters to the control system and we would use those parameters to sort of position the loop where we needed it to be for the, the next steps. Um, so th that's what I just described. This, this loop centering was carried out using a very procedural machine vision sort of base technique. And it was designed to recognize these standard sort of tennis racket shaped Hampton nylon loops. But it was a little bit finicky. It did not perform very well in lighting conditions. If the lighting conditions were off and the edge finding didn't work very well, then it would be hard to see the sample. And, and then along came this company called MightyGen, which started making all these goofy looking lithographically um, manufactured mounts, which the researchers loved because they have all these different shapes and different size samples to fit in them. And the, the loop, this procedural machine vision tech just did not work. So at this point, we were sort of thinking about, you know, there's got to be a way to use machine learning and convolutional neural networks to do some sort of more intelligent recognition of the, these sample amounts so that we could make our pipeline more robust again. So Rick said, this can't be that difficult, right? I mean, surely if we can differentiate a chihuahua from a blueberry muffin, we should be able to recognize like a sample loop within a uniformly lit background. I mean, this is actually, to me, looks like a really difficult image recognition or image classification problem, but um, you know, Google has figured out how to do this. Um, so we figured we ought to be able to figure out how to do it too. And so at this point we started, you know, I, I have no background in um, machine learning or, or artificial intelligence or any of this kind of stuff. So I was like sort of casting around, trying to figure out how to approach this problem. We played a little bit around with a, a, um, a tool we found from NVIDIA called NVIDIA Digits, um, but it really just nothing worked for us. I think there was just too many, too much stuff we didn't understand about what was going on in this black box. And there was too many knobs to turn that we didn't really know what they did. And we just were feeling a little bit frustrated. So at this point I reached out to um, the, the, the IT um, consulting group at, at the lab. And I'd actually taken advantage of, of, of the IT group at LBL before, because this is how I learned how to use Python. And I, this is how I learned how to use Git. And they have a lot of great resources out there. And I'm sure, and in fact, uh, they, I had seen advertised through them that there was a machine learning class being taught, um, partnered with the D lab down on campus. And so I signed up to take this two day class on uh, introduction to machine learning parts one and two. And it was taught by someone who was getting their PhD like in completely not like my field, like a completely like some sort of social science field. And I was just amazed that like so many different groups of people were at this class learning to use machine learning for all kinds of different anal data analysis. So it was really, really quite eye-opening for me. Um, and during that class, we learned sort of how to use TensorFlow and, and stuff like that. And it, and it was more tabular data. We weren't doing image stuff, but I could tell just from the class that it would be, um, you know, at least I had my foot in the door. And at the, I think towards the end of that um, two-day class, I, I met Shaw, who, worked up at the lab and I, I started talking with him and his colleague Feng Shen and we sort of started working together and I kind of outlined the problem that I was um, approaching or that I was wanting to deal with and they, they really sort of got me going on this and, and helped me um, get get started and so we um, used Google Cloud Platform which at the time um, was called AutoML. I think it still is AutoML but Google's now put all of these tools in one platform called Vertex AI. Um, so you can, Vertex AI has like natural language processing and um, like uh, image detection stuff and like sound. I don't know what that's called. Anyways, they have all, all of the different um, types of data that you would want to perform a machine learning on. They've sort of 
grouped under this one umbrella Vertex AI platform now. And so I will, and, and if I'm going too long and we need to end the meeting, just let me know. Um, um, I don't wanna get into too much detail, but I do wanna give you a sense of, of like the steps that were involved. So the, the first thing we had to do was prepare some training images. Um, so these, you know, I had access to thousands and thousands of pictures of, of these things. So I think we started with just 300 images and that I'd called from um, our, our file system up here at the beam line um, that we needed to then label them, right? So for, for object detection and classification, so I, we needed to label them, which is kind of a painful part of the process. But there are a lot of good tools available for that now. Essentially, you're you're drawing boxes around the things that you want the your your model to recognize. Um, and you then feed these data, these labeled data sets, go into a training algorithm. Um, in our case, we used Google Cloud. And then once you've sort of trained a model that seems like it does what you want it to do, then you need to deploy the model and use it actually in like a meaningful way. And for that, we ended up using an edge deployment. So many times you will just deploy your model in the cloud and you'll send your data up to the cloud, have the inferences done in the cloud, and then you'll get your results back and parse them and do whatever you want with them. But we needed to have much, much faster um, responses. Like I wanted to be able to essentially stream images at 30 images per second from our video camera into this model and get results back instantly. So we ended up doing an edge deployment. So um, this is just a screen cap of the Google Cloud platform. Um, and on the left-hand side, there's a bunch of little areas, dashboard data sets, training, and there's a bunch of these I did not use, but essentially you go to the dashboard, you create a new data set. Um, oh yeah, so you can select either image, tabular, text or video as the type of data. So I'd selected image. And if you're just doing image classification, you, you know, you can do this one. I'm doing image classification and detection. So I picked that third option there. Um, you then have to add the images to your data set and you can upload them from your computer or if you want to, if you can stick them in a, a Google Cloud bucket, I know they're not, I don't think they're called buckets, AWS is buckets. Anyways, you throw it up into your, um, your Google Cloud storage area and you can kind of load them from there. Um, and it's, the, the platform is very easy to use. And as you're going through each of these steps, it really, it's, it's fairly well documented, tells you, you know, what are the requirements for the images? How many images do you need? And if you get into the details of the documentation, it tells you, you know, how small of an object can you detect? Like how many pixels wide or tall can it be? How many objects per image can you detect? All that kind of stuff. So it really, really kind of holds your hand as you're preparing your data for training. Once the data is uploaded, it gives you a nice overview of what you've uploaded. So in our case, we were wanting to essentially detect three things. We wanted to detect the pin. So that's the metal support thing outlined in green here. And then we wanted to detect the loop at the at the tip, and we wanted to classify it either, either as a mighty gen mount or a nylon loop. And so, once you know this this overview here, just sort of gives you some confirmation that the previous steps of uploading and labeling your data have been interpreted properly by the Vertex AI platform. And so this looks pretty good, I think. So we had 281 images, and the the Google Cloud platform will automatically partition them into the training set, and then it will hold out, you know, roughly 10% for validation and testing, so that we don't get bias in our in our trained model. You then submit it for training, and the training for this did not take too long. I don't exactly recall, but maybe a couple hours at most. Um, and we got a pretty, you know, I don't know exactly how this compares to other types of models, but this looked pretty darn good to me with precision and recall, like in the high nineties. So it seems like it performed very, very well. When I trained the model, I specifically did um, 
train two different versions of it. One that could be deployed in the cloud, just so I could test it. But then when I was happy with these results here, we then deployed one that could be downloaded. So you do need to make that decision early on in the training. So for the edge optimized model, they offer three different options. You can download a TensorFlow Lite package. I guess if you're wanting to deploy this onto like um, mobile devices, you can download it as um, a TF saved model to run in a Docker container. And that's what I ended up doing or you can download it as a TensorFlow JavaScript package. Uh, so you can run it in, in a browser in like a node web app or something like that. Um, and if you, um, don't de if you don't train an edge model, but you just do the regular training, then you can deploy it to an endpoint in Google Cloud Platform. And you can actually then just test it right in your browser, just upload images and you get the results right back. But because for speed reasons, we wanted to have this run on our hardware at the Beamline. So we uh, had previously purchased um, a pretty beefy machine that had eight Titan V GPUs in it. And I wanted to deploy our trained model, which was working fairly well uh, locally at the Beamline. And so this involved installing the Google SDK kit and the NVIDIA Docker tools and downloading that model, the Edge model from GCP. You have to authenticate the GCP tool, set up a service account, and then GCP provides sort of pre-made Docker images. So I installed their, the Docker image that they recommend, and then it's ready. It just, once it's started, it's just sitting there listening on port, whatever, 8,888, and you can just send your, your request directly to that port in the form of a JSON package, and the images are base64 encoded, and then it will send the results back as a JSON package. And so um, before I sort of show you how we implemented this in a little more detail, I just wanted to show you how good this thing is. I was super impressed. Like this model, even though we only trained it with like 280 images, was able to accurately, you know, accurately enough for us, draw boxes around the loops and around the mitogen mounts. And it was able to differentiate between the two, which I just find amazing. I mean, machine learning is all it is cracked up to be. It, it is hype. So um, th these, these movies were actually made very early on when we were just sort of like, is this going to work or is this not going to work? And before we had actually trained the three object detection model. And so, so as you can see, as we rotate it, we're getting information, information back about the size of this box. And if we parse out that information and plot the height of the box versus the rotation angle, you know, it's gonna trace out this sinusoidal curve and we can use curve fitting. And then that allows us to accurately identify which angle has our face position and which angle has our edge on position. And so I wrote a program in Python um, that then integrates all of these things. So we have motor controllers, which are moving our sample on the goniometer, rotating it. We have a CCD camera, which is hooked up to an access video server. And we have a CentOS 7 machine that's running our main control system. So our main control system is called DCSS for Distributed Control System Server. And the way that this works is very hub and spoke. So this is like the hub controls everything. And then it has all these spokes, which we call DHSs, our distributed hardware service servers. And so I wrote um, a little DHS, which plugs into the central control system, which I'm calling loop DHS. And the loop DHS code runs on this machine that has the NVIDIA GPUs. And it um, receives a command from DCSS that says, hey, let's, I'd like to center this sample. I'm going to start rotating it, but I need you to tell me when you're ready to receive images. And so the loop DHS says, okay, I'm ready to start receiving images. You can go ahead and start rotating the sample whenever you're ready. Then DCS says, okay, I'm going to start rotating the sample. And it sends a command off to this PMAC DHS, which um, controls this motor controller, which turns the goniometer. The minute the goniometer starts turning, it sends a five volt signal to our access video server, which then starts acquiring images at 30 frames per second and sending those into a socket over here at loop DHS. So loop DHS is now receiving these JPEG images 
at 30 frames per second. It's taking the images, base 64 encoding them, sending them over to this Docker image that's running the, the GCP auto ML model. And they're, it's getting the uh, information back, parsing the information, and then processing it further in DCSS so we can make further decisions about how to move our sample in order to get it aligned with the X-ray beam. And so I put all this code, this is my first project that I ever published on GitHub. So if you do go check it out, you gotta be kind to me. I'm not a programmer. Um, and it's written in Python. It's dependent on this DHS framework project. This is the one that Giles helped me with. He's like the professional programmer. He sort of helped me with the back end. There's a lot of socket communication that happens here. So he wrote the back end, how to monitor the socket, close a socket, open a socket if the socket disappears, that kind of stuff. So it receives the instruction. And this is just saying in words what I already told you. Essentially, um, this was a really fun project for me because I got to learn so much new stuff. I got to learn about Google Cloud Platform. I got to learn how easy this machine learning stuff is <laughs> if you use one of these um, cloud provided uh, platforms. And we actually are using this at the Beamline and we've been using it for the last year and a half. It works great. I've not had to retrain the model. Um, you know, we, we, it does fail every once in a while when there's a, an extremely large sample that's bigger than the, the field of view of our video camera. Um, or if the lighting got turned down to 10%, it's really, really dark and it just can't see anything. So there are some modes where it will fail, but it's very robust and I'm really happy with how it turned out. So in summary, um, I would say, you know, from my perspective, AI ML has become democratized to a huge degree. And just the fact that we have these tools available to us from Google, Amazon, and uh, Microsoft, I guess, if someone has access to Azure. Um, I made this loop DHS, loop DHS to robustly and accurately classify and detect nylon loops and these mitogen mounts. And it's just way more resilient to variable lighting and stuff. So, um, and then I always like to throw up a Randall Mon Monroe um, cartoon on any of my talks. So. so this is your machine learning system. Yep, you just pour your data in this big pile of linear algebra and then collect the answers on the other side. Well, what if the answers are wrong? Well, you just stir the pile until things start looking great. Right. So thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so very much. I feel like XKCD is always relevant, especially oh, yes. There's with always, science. There's always something. Yep. <laughs> I loved hearing about how um, you all kind of linked up together at the machine learning workshop in the D lab and it started this collaboration and turned into this very yeah. large project. So um, thank yeah. you for sharing that and, and your whole talk. Yeah, absolutely. So we do have a few minutes for questions. So if anybody has a question, um, feel free to raise your hand and I can call on you. Or if you would like to type it in the chat, I'd be happy to uh, read that out. I'm seeing great work, very inspiring, fantastic talk. I completely agree. That was so cool. <laughs> oh. mm -hmm. Thank you. I know in, in years past, the lab has had an annual open house where like the entire community is invited up and given tours of the advanced light source, but it's been a while since they've done that. So I'm, I'm hoping that if things start to go back to normal, um, we have a new lab, relatively new lab director, that, that it would be opened up to the community again. Because I know a lot of, it just makes it less mysterious, I think, for and not, not just people at UC Berkeley, but like the entire city of Berkeley and, and in fact, the whole East Bay, you know, usually would get lots of people up there. So that was always fun to take people around the ALS and give them a tour of the beam line. It's really quite impressive to see in person. I completely agree. I've actually had the pleasure of visiting and it is amazing in there. Yeah, <laughs> Highly yeah. recommended. Yeah. These um, automation uh, pipelines that we are developing at the Beamline are were, came in really um, valuable during this last couple years when many researchers weren't allowed to come to the Beamline to collect their data. So, you know, they would be doing remote experiments using, uh, you know, NX 
you know, no machine NX to connect to a desktop and, and they would be able to do their entire um, experiments remotely. And having these types of automation tools um, really helps them be more efficient. And, you know, and the lab management allowed us to have, you know, people out there collecting data on COVID related proteins. So, you know, it was really, really important. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I see so there's a some, question in the chat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think we're all jumping to read this does question. Does my model provide a measure of confidence? I'm curious if you have to intervene manually sometimes to fix edge cases. Yeah, so that very rarely. Um, so I don't know how the model confidence is measured. I am assuming it's one of those values that comes back from Google Cloud Platform after you've trained your model, like the recall number. Both of those numbers were like 96%. The model's quite good. And just based on its real world deployment at the beam line, I'd say two or 3% failure rate where, you know, and so when I get a, when I, when I get no answer or the answer is below a confidence level, I'm sorry, when, when the JSON results come back from the inference, it gives you sort of a, a confidence interval in there, like between zero and one. So I have just set a threshold. If, if I don't get an object back that's detected at 85% confidence, then we'll say it's failed. So, and that happens about every two or 3%. And then I just move on to the next sample. I'm like, okay, either there's nothing here or there's something wrong. So we'll just take that sample, have the robot put it back in the liquid and nitrogen, and we'll just move on to the next sample. Um, but yes, the, 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 the model does give you back a data package with, I think that it's 50. Whether there's one or two objects in your image, it'll still give you 50. It's gonna give you the top 50. And usually there's only one. So you'll, you'll see like the first object with these XYZ coordinates is 0.98. And then the next one is 0.0001. It's just the noise, right? But for some reason, I've not been able to get the Google uh, the, the, the auto ML model to return just a, you know, five, the five top hits. It just, for some reason, it's hard coded. It wants to return 50 hits. So I don't know if that answers your question or not. I think I saw a thumbs up down there. Yeah. Well, Jeff, would you like to um, have any, do you have any closing thoughts or would you like to wrap up this meetup? If Scott was sure. your guest. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I, I'll do so hoping my connection doesn't, doesn't drop again a second time, but a uh, giant thank you to Scott for doing this today. Um, I've seen Scott, you know, Feng Chen and Shaw helped him with with the, the auto ML stuff. And so I got to kind of tag along and listen in as they were doing the work for him. So it was kind of cool for me to see, but this is the first time I've actually seen that last portion of how you you actually implemented it actually at your beam line as, as that container image. So that was for me both new information and actually really cool to see how you actually ended up putting that into use. So, um, so great talk. Um, thank you so much, Scott, for being here today and doing this. Um, you know, it's a lot of work for uh, to put this stuff together. So you're um, welcome. I really appreciate everything you did for that. Thank so um, thank, always, thank you. I don't know when I, you know, it's funny because I was actually, I was looking at these old notes and I had presented to you guys all about two years ago and I highlighted four projects of which Scott's was one of them. Um, saying that there's this really cool auto ML image thing going on up at the beam lines. And so um, I know I've talked about it before, but looking through some of my old notes, I found it again. I go, oh, yeah, I've talked about Scott before. So um, just, I know I'm gushing a little bit, a little fanboy here, but that was really cool. So um, fantastic stuff. So um, I guess uh, to wrap it up, thanks everyone for being here. Um, you know, if uh, anyone is interested in some of this research, uh, I guess reach out to Amy. Myself, uh, Sean Feng Chen are also, you know, attached to, to campus as well too. So they're available to talk about you know, some, some of the work they did behind this. So we're always happy to talk about what we've done. Maybe we can help you out a little bit here and there and uh, any questions reach out to us, but thank you all so much. Uh, looking forward to next month with uh, the talk on Azure and, and, and